I will. Hello, and thanks very much for coming along this evening. I am actually here in real time at home uh, and chatting to you, but I recorded the talk a few days ago so that you'll, <clears throat> the talk will start uh, running soon. Uh, the, the fantastic illustrator will, will stop in the middle to see what, he, what, what he's dreamed up uh, for, in real time and live from my talk. And please enter questions in the Q&A uh, and up and down vote them. I think you, I'm not sure you can down vote, but you can certainly up vote. And I'll do my very best at the end. I'll stay on and I'll answer those questions uh, at the end. So uh, over to Jane now, and uh, hopefully you can now see the talk. This is the building I work in. It's the Institute of Metabolic Science in Cambridge. And there we try to figure out what are the causes uh, of obesity? What are the adverse consequences of obesity? How does that work? And what can we do to try and fix these problems? Now. As you'll be aware, in the last year or so, uh, the pandemic of obesity has clashed with the pandemic of COVID-19 in a very nasty way, in that people with obesity seem to be doing particularly badly when they encounter the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It is very gratifying for those of us who work in the area that the current government is now taking the problem seriously. And as you can see, the Prime Minister is starting to set out plans to tackle obesity. I think you'll understand part of the reason for that is that he himself was part of that pandemic clash when he got COVID-19 in April last year, around the same time as I got it myself. And he recognized that the reason he did worse than many of his colleagues was that he had his own personal problem uh, with obesity. Now, today, I'm going to ask a few questions. I'm going to ask, is true obesity truly associated with the outcomes of COVID? Is this specific to COVID-19, or does it happen with other respiratory infections? If so, if it's really true, what mechanisms could work behind that? Can we do anything about it? And I'd like to end by asking whether the interest in obesity that's generated by COVID-19, could we start thinking and tackling the problem of obesity uh, more seriously? So the first question is, is obesity truly associated with worst, uh, worse outcomes of COVID-19? The first indications came from a whole lot of small reports from individual hospitals around the world who kept noticing that many of their sickest patients right at the beginning of the pandemic seemed to be obese. But of course, scientifically, that's very difficult because it's patchy data, small numbers, et cetera. So it took the power of, and, and, and thankfully, the UK, is, as you'll be aware, has really made fantastic scientific contributions during this uh, COVID epidemic. One of the contributions the UK has made is through terrific large population-based studies. So there's a study called Open Safely of 17 and a half million GP records, and they can be linked to people going into hospital and how they do with COVID. And let me just take you through this uh, rather complicated slide, but one that's worth taking a little bit of time on. This is what the bottom is called hazard ratio i.e. if your hazard ratio is five times, something is five times more likely to happen. What we're looking at here are deaths from COVID. And <clears throat> so, so looking from the top, we're looking via age group. Now, you all know that age is a major risk factor for dying from COVID. And if you take this, the standard as being people between 50 and 60 in this, in this age group, that was, the, that was the mean age in this GP-based uh, 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 cohort, and put them at one, you can see that as you go up the decades, there's an astonishing increase in mortality as you get as you get older. And here is in the, in the individuals over 80, more than tenfold more. And then in the younger people, much less. And in the very young, right off the left end, end, end of the scale. And then you can work down the graph and look at males versus females. You'll have heard that males do worse. And indeed, they do about twice as many <clears throat> deaths, relatively speaking, in males versus females. Now, here we come to obesity at a mild level, a medium level, and a severe level. And as you can see, graded up at the scale is a substantial impact uh, on obesity, uh, of obesity on dying. Worse, for example, certainly much worse than asthma, even quite severe asthma is here. And in people who had cancer up to over five years ago, really not much of an impact. Cancer just in the last four or five years, not as much as obesity. So obesity, because it's so common, these re relative ratios really make a difference. A lot of people are affected by this, uh, uh, by, by this phenomenon. 
with my colleagues in Oxford, I have contributed personally to some of this work. Uh, and and uh, we've looked in a different GP record, so-called Q research, in a little bit more detail at things like ITU admission, hospital ad admission, as well as death uh, uh, from, from, from in COVID-19 in a very similar way to the previous uh, study. But if you start looking at ITU admission, you can see these, these this ratio goes, starts to go up even at uh, overweight levels. So you can see that the risk of being admitted to ITU starts climbing at, a, at the levels of overweight. This is a body mass index of 30 when obesity starts, but even before that, even overweight influences the uh, uh, risk of uh, having an ITU admission. The risks, the relative risks of being obese were substantially greater in younger and in black patients. And when you got very old, over 80, body mass index didn't seem to matter at all in the, in the, in the, in the, in the very oldest groups. But this uh, effect is young, effect bigger in younger and black people fit, fit, fitted with those early reports of obese people, particularly those from other ethnic, well, non-white ethnicities, um, uh, having a particularly uh, uh, um, bad outcome uh, from, from, um, uh, from COVID-19. And when we look and dig a bit deeper into what it is about obesity, it's those obese people who have what we call markers of ectopic fat, evidence that the chemistry in their body is changing, has a much bigger, bigger effect on COVID outcomes. In other words, it's the metabolically sick individuals with obesity, not the metabolically healthy individuals who are getting more of the worse outcomes with COVID-19. <clears throat> so back to my second question, is this special for COVID-19 or does it happen in other uh, uh, conditions? Well, the answer is pretty clear. If you look at seasonal flu, which does kill people every year, there's no association of body mass index or weight with how much you die uh, uh, or not of seasonal flu. And if you get what's called ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, after a severe sepsis, after a car accident, et cetera, you actually get what's called the obesity paradox. Obese people tend to do a little bit better and get off ITU more than those people who are, who are thin. So it's not a generalized phenomenon of having a very bad pulmonary uh, infection or pulmonary inflammation. <clears throat> yes, here he says it's, it's improved in this population compared to individuals with a normal body mass index. <clears throat> How does SARS cause severe illness and death? Does obesity influence the risk of getting the virus? Might obesity influence viral behavior once a, parent, once a person is infected? And might or might obesity influence how your body responds to actually having uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection. So the next part of my talk, I'm going to talk about these possibilities and how uh, SARS-CoV-2 and obesity might intersect. But to understand why obesity is bad for outcomes, you really have to go to the heart of where the virus is really causing its most severe damage. Most people who die from COVID-19 do so because the lungs become severely inflamed and dysfunctional and unable to, to carry enough oxygen into the body to allow people to survive, even if they're on ventilators. And so to understand that, you need to understand a little bit about how the lung works. And your <clears throat> windpipe brings air down, in, oxygenated air down into the bronchies, down, bronchi down into the smaller bronchioles. And here's the business end of the lungs the oxygen exchange or little organelle called the alveolus, the alveolus. And it is a beautifully uh, designed little air sac. And when your blue deoxygenated blood uh, comes back from, from, from the body, the, the lungs uh, 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 take, uh, 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 the oxygen moves into the deoxygenated blood and then it returns it to the body through these capillaries, very, very dense blood uh, supply and then returns it uh, through the pulmonary uh, veins into, into, the, uh, into the heart and then out to, the rest of, uh, out to the rest of your body. And then we have to look more deeply into the alveolus and say, what makes up this alveolus? It's got some very thin cells that make the thin lining, the type 1 uh, epithelial cell. And then it's got these fat guys, the alveolar type 2 cells. They make the sort of lubricant. Uh, that, that lines and surfaces the inside of the, the cell. So they're, they're, they're cells that are churning out stuff that keeps the inside of the air sac 
uh, healthy and moist. And there are also some scavenger cells that here, the macrophages, which gobble up any bits of dirt and dust and bugs that might happen to be down in the, in, in, in the, in the alveolus. And, and this is where the real issues with the virus uh, uh, come in. So when the virus get, gets into you, it generally gets in in your nasopharynx, the back of your nose, and it proliferates first in cells at the back of the nasal cavity. And then having proliferated and, 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 and multiplied there, it then makes its journey down into the lungs. And in particular, it makes a journey down into the alveolus and makes a bead, takes a bead on these type two pneumocytes, these type two, these, these cells that make the surfactant, that make the lubricant. And why does it do that? Well, it does that because on the surface of these cells is this thing you may have heard of, ACE2. ACE2 has normal functions in the body. It's present in many, many different cells in the body. And like all viruses, viruses hijack normal uh, cell proteins and they hijack them and they get they use them to get into the to the cell and there's ace2 in these cells there's also uh, an enzyme that breaks down uh, ace2 and allows it to come inside the cell and both of these are critical for the virus to enter the cell now once the virus enters the cell it causes havoc it causes cellular damage it can cause cellular death it can cause fusion of one cell with the next cell and this agitates a, a, a massive inflammatory response. Now, you will mostly have heard about antibodies and T cells and all the responses we make, the immune responses. These are beautiful and special and targeted weapons that we manufacture against any insulting virus that comes along. But it takes us a bit of time to make those. As well as those, we kind of keep a baseball bat behind the front door. Uh, we have a number of weapons that we can immediately use to bludgeon uh, uh, these invading, uh, or, or certainly the cells that have been invaded by, by viruses. And this is one of those, one of those weapons, the more, more blunt weapons, is the complement system. And so what happens in the lung of a person with bad infection but from SARS-CoV-2 is a very vigorous inflammation, a lot of evidence of activation of this complement system. And really compared to other viral infections of the lungs, all viral infections cause these inflammation, these cells, inflammatory cells come in trying to gobble up damaged cells, trying to uh, uh, get rid of uh, viral particles, trying to kill cells that uh, contain uh, uh, bad viral particles. But particularly in, in, in COVID-19, there's a huge amount of inflammation in the surrounding blood, <clears throat> blood vessels with lots of, uh, uh, of, of uh, as I say, complement activation, but also damage to the blood vessels and clotting. Clotting being a particular feature uh, in the small blood vessels, seen much more in this viral infection than in many others. Here's a picture, for example, of uh, a lung of an unfortunate person who died from uh, COVID-19. Uh, th these are the air sacs, the alveolus. You can see there's blood in them because the capillary wall has been damaged. So you see the red blood cells where they shouldn't be in the, in the air sac. You see here a classic, what's called microthrombus, a clot mainly made from platelets, the small clotting corpuscles in, in the blood. And this is really very characteristic of COVID-19. Lots of these micro uh, thrombi, lots of clotting off of the small blood vessels uh, in the lung. You can see it with other lung infections, but it's much more uh, prevalent with this particular uh, uh, virus. And that may give us a clue as to why obesity is so uh, bad uh, when it happens uh, alongside uh, this virus. So what could obesity do? Well, obesity could ba basically do things. It could two things. It can change how the, vi how, the, how the virus behaves, or it could change how the host response to the virus uh, uh, occurs. So let's look at what possible influences it could have on viral behavior. Could you get more viral exposure if you're obese? There's no doubt in the UK that obesity is commoner in people of lower uh, income status and, and, and who have more difficult in, in, in living environments and, and jobs that might give them more uh, uh, viral exposure. But we know now from some very large uh, studies in the, in, the, in the UK, there's no evidence that obese people catch more SARS-CoV-2 than non-obese people. So it's not an exposure thing. They don't, people with obesity don't get more uh, COVID-19 or they, they don't get more SARS-CoV-2 viral exposure. 
could they spread their, their uh, virus from the nasopharynx to the pneumocytes uh, 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 possibly quicker? Obesity certainly causes an increased uh, prevalence of reflux. You know, the reflux you get in your tummy, and with a, with a big tummy, you can get more reflux. And people have suggested maybe that causes more coughing and aspiration, and that those those can uh, particles can go down the lung a bit more. That's purely uh, purely speculative. What about viral invasion? Well, actually, it's interesting because the virus does need some fat to actually make it make the protein assemble. And there have been suggestions that a, a lipid-rich, a fat-rich environment might help it make a, 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 the viral spoke protein. There are also suggestions that the cells of the body can respond to diet in terms of how much of this ACE2 tempers they make, the things, the machinery that needs to get virus into the body. And we certainly know of some viruses, hepatitis C being a best example, where the amount of fat in a cell is really an essential. The, the, the virus uses little fat droplets in the cell to kind of island hop within the, within the cell. And so perhaps the fatty content, contents of, the, of a cell help uh, the virus to proliferate and help the viral life, life cycle. Well, finally, could it, uh, it influence how much, how easy a virus finds to kill your cell? When a virus goes into a cell, it often induces what, what, what is known as the Warburg effect. In other words, it makes the cell switch from using other things, using things like fat and protein for energy, switch entirely to using carbohydrate and glucose. And if your cells are laden with lipids, they're often less flexible and less able to do this survival response, the Warburg effect. So perhaps lipid overload can influence how the virus, uh, how lethal the virus is to each individual uh, cell. Again, these are all possibilities. There's no proof of any of these yet. To understand what obesity might do to the body, the host response to COVID, I think uh, we need to stand back a little bit and actually ask, what is it that obesity does to our body generally? <clears throat> obesity, by definition, has to be, it's a simple law of physics, you have to intake more energy chronically than you expend. And if you do that, then you end up with this state that we call obesity, which is effectively just an expanded mass of this lipid triglyceride in fat cells. Now, we are interested in obesity from a medical point of view, not from a cosmetic point of view. We're interested in it because it uh, is associated with bad health outcomes. And I think it's useful sometimes to break those uh, health outcomes into three. There are the, if you like, mechanical and gravitational effects, the osteoarthritis of your knees, the reflux that I told you about, the narrowed airways that give you severe snoring and sleep apnea. All of those are related to the mass or volume or weight of, 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 of fat that you carry. And therefore, you know, that line can be drawn pretty effectively. But what about these? Why do people with obesity get more of specific cancers? And why do they get a whole range of metabolic and endocrine <coughs> uh, diseases? Is it to do with the expanded mass? Or is, <clears throat> or is it perhaps that there's something a bit more subtle going on, that these things occur because of this chronic excess and the obesity is just a marker of chronic overnutrition, i.e. energy intake being chronically greater than energy expenditure, and not really to do with the mass of, uh, of triglycerides in the fat cells at all. There, <clears throat> the first question I'll just go to is now the mechanical one. If you read in the popular press about obesity and COVID, the commonest thing that's talked about is, are the, is a, an explanation based, on, if you like, on mechanics. Uh, they think people feel it's obvious that if you have too much fat in your abdominal cavity, you splint the diaphragm, or if you have a lot of fat in your chest, you have a heavy chest, and you can't breathe more easily, and they must explain uh, uh, the worst outcomes. But if that was true, then obese people should do worse in all other forms of se severe or acute lung infection or injury, but they do not have worse outco uh, outcomes from the vast majority of those uh, 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 conditions. And as I've told you, the worst outcomes for obesity start really with just the overweight people who truly don't really have anything much in the way of substantial weight of adipose tissue pressing on anything. So it seems unlikely that that's an explanation. We also hear that because you get sleep apnea is very common, maybe that plays a role. But of course, when you're on a ventilator, uh, you bypass your pharynx completely. You've got a tube right down into your lungs how narrow your upper airways are is irrelevant. And those people with obesity still do worse, even when they've been ventilated. So 
a mechanical explanation doesn't really seem to be tenable. So let me take you through what I think are probably the two major theories about why obesity is bad for you generally, and then how that might intersect with COVID-19. And the, the first one is the so-called ectopic fat theory, or fat in the wrong place. In other words, when you lose weight and you put on adipose tissue, it may be counterintuitive to you, but adipose tissue isn't infinitely expandable. We can't keep putting that positive energy balance into fat cells. There's a relatively limited pool, there's a limited size of each individual fat cell, and the pool of precursor cells that can turn into fat cells is limited. And so as we put on more and more weight, it's almost inevitable, at least in most of us, that some of that excess fat starts going where it shouldn't, into non-professional cells. These, these cells, the fat cells, are professional cells. They're meant to, to store fat in these one big droplet. But what happens in the as you progressively put on weight, fat starts to go into other organs. It starts going into liver and muscle and blood vessels. And these cause all sorts of metabolic havoc. They cause a problem with how insulin works in your body. And because they, they do that, the pancreas then responds and starts making much more insulin. And you, you get these problems of insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. It can exhaust the pancreas and end up in, in type 2 diabetes. But a whole range of other things, not just diabetes, occur as a result of this ectopic fat. I sometimes describe this as kind of the soggy bathroom carpet model of, of, of metabolic disease. When I was uh, growing up, we didn't have a we didn't have any central heating, and, and therefore we did actually have a, a carpet on the bathroom floor. So 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 uh, I think it's, it, it doesn't sound quite so strange uh, 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 from my perspective. And so. Um, what we've got here is a picture of metabolic health. Someone's left the tap on and there's energy coming in and they've left the plug out and there's energy going out and you get a certain head of pressure in the bath and everything's fine. The whole system behind the carpet ends up nicely clean. You're healthy because your stored fat in the adipocyte hasn't exceeded your storage capacity. But we will often think about metabolic disease and obesity is that people eat too much, in other words, turn the tap on more, and the, and the, and the bath fill, fills up, or we don't expend enough energy, or indeed a bit of both. And, and with that, we overspill our, our storage capacity, and we end up with uh, metabolic uh, uh, ill health and, and a soggy carpet. But what we've often, I think, uh, uh, failed to identify is that um, not everybody has the same size bath. In other words, you can get into this metabolic trouble, uh, yes, from eating too much, and yes, from not expending enough energy. But there's a huge variation between us in how uh, healthily, uh, how much we can healthily store uh, excess. Each one of us, in a way, has a personal fat threshold, and we don't quite know in advance what that is, sadly. So you can develop these metabolic complications, some people, with just becoming overweight. Others have to become substantially obese, those with bigger baths, before they develop the metabolic uh, uh, complications. So the second uh, thing, me 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 the second mechanism that we think about when obesity is, is, is having bad effects on, on the person, the second mechanism is inflammation. Um, so as fat cells grow and as the adipose depots grow, more fat cells die, and dead cells are an offense to the organism, and we have cells living there, small numbers, that proliferate and migrate to, to the dying and dead fat cells and start gobbling them up. <clears throat> but they're inflammatory cells. They're macrophages, and they set up a degree of inflammation in obese adipose tissue. And that can sometimes be so vigorous that that inflammation spills out over into the circulation, and we get levels of these inflammation, these these signals that increase inflammation in our bodies going into the, uh, into the circulation or certainly in high concentrations locally wherever there's fat tissue. And remember, there's fat tissue around most of our organs. So if we start looking at these two mechanisms, inflammation in adipose tissue here and ectopic fat causing insulin resistance, we can start seeing where obesity uh, uh, may start to impact and give you a worse outcome uh, uh, from, from COVID. So 
First, we have the evidence that there's more inflammation. Now, we know that a bad outcome of COVID is, 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 is partly at least dependent not on the virus, but on an over-vigorous host response and an over-vigorous post-inflammatory response. And we know that because the steroid dexamethasone, it actually saves lives in COVID. And that tells us immediately that it's part of the problem with COVID is an over-vigorous immune response. And in obesity, we have this excess of IL-6 TNF-alpha um, making this so-called cytokine storm worse in, with it, with, with, within our lungs. But there are many more factors than that. There's another <clears throat> protein that you won't uh, have heard of. It's made only in fat cells. But paradoxically, when you get fat, you get less of this made in, in, in fat, fat cells, rather remarkably less. And what's become apparent recently is that this protein, adiponectin, seems to have a protective role in lung capillaries, exactly where a lot of the damage is going. If you put this inflammatory molecule TNF on, on lung cells, on lung capillary cells, you get a massive increase in the signal that brings white cells to come and, and fight and be inflamed. But if you put a diponectin on, on, you can completely, or not completely, but at least partially dampen that <clears throat> down. So a diponectin seems to be an important lung anti-inflammatory uh, uh, pr uh, protein, and it's reduced in the circulation of obese people. Another thing, the thing I told you about when I gave the analogy of using a baseball bat behind your uh, uh, front door, the complement system, that's just sitting there ready to bite uh, 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 any, any invading uh, 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 or, or, organism. And again, we know in obesity that there's an increase, particularly of one form, the C3 form. Now, the good news with that is that even if you just go on a six-week diet, you can reduce your C3 levels really quite uh, uh, markedly, well before you lose that much weight. So that, that I'll come back to that kind of principle in a moment. So obesity, obesity does induce uh, having more baseball bats, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and that, again, primes with the inflammatory primes uh, 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 the, you, for having a particularly vigorous lung infl in, inflamed lung response. But it's worse than that because you may also develop fat within the lung cells themselves. And it's been recently shown that we're familiar with fatty liver and even fatty muscle. But in the literature now, it's becoming clear that obese animals, at least, and we have yet to look in humans, but when you get obese, you can actually get aberrant and abnormal amounts of fat in the lung, and particularly in those cells, I told you, that makes the, make the slippy stuff. So those cells could themselves be affected by obesity. Then we have the insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia, and, and, and they uh, cause the, the, the cells, the endothelium, the lining of the, of, the, of, the, of the lung capillaries to be dysfunctional. They also make platelets stickier that make the thrombi. They also reduce, sorry, increase an inhibitor of breakdown of clots. So all of this is a kind of perfect storm where metabolic conditions impact on the lungs of people with uh, obesity and COVID. And it's intriguing, there may be links to other associations. The insulin resistance levels are generally higher in men than in women. They're also higher in people of South Asian origin, and indeed the insulin levels are higher in people of African origin. And so that link between poor outcomes with people of South Asian and of African origin, origin may have some overlap with the, with the, with the problems of the, of the, that are associated with, with, with obesity. But the good thing is that we know that we can start to improve, and certainly we can pretty rapidly improve the ectopic fat by caloric restriction and by physical activity. And we know also that we can improve high insulin levels and insulin resistance by certain drugs. And in fact, one family of drugs, pyoglitazone being an example, has a particularly powerful effect on increasing adiponectin and correcting the low adiponectin uh, levels. So more research is needed, because I think that what we've all, all we've done today so far has come up really with hypotheses that it's the abnormal metabolic state rather than the obesity itself that impacts adversely on COVID outcomes. And we will hypothesize that improving the abnormal metabolic state of at-risk people in advance of them encountering SARS-CoV-2 should improve out outcomes. So how might we test these uh, hypotheses? Well, one thing we can do, and it may seem strange to say we can use genetics, but genetics is an increasingly powerful tool in human uh, uh, health science. 
We can do a thing called Mendelian randomization. In other words, we can take uh, uh, people and look at look at their genomes, and we can say wh whether that they carry the genetic variants that would make them likely to be obese or make them likely to be insulin resistant. And we can compare outcomes against that genetic score. And if we see that uh, obesity genetic scores increase uh, uh, the likelihood of doing badly with COVID, but even more so the insulin, the scores for insulin resistance do worse, then we'll know that obesity may be acting through insulin resistance. So we're on, <clears throat> this sort of work is ongoing very much around the world at the moment, with massive international consortia trying to use the power of human genetics to try and get at these mechanistic uh, links. We can, of course, and you'll be familiar with how good Britain has been at doing uh, randomized controlled trials. We could do a trial of diet and physical activity in a subgroup of individuals who, 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 who are put into the trial and others who are just given simple advice to see who, who would do better if they encounter uh, COVID. Of course, as we, we need the, for, for these, we need to be in a place where, where there's enough COVID and thankfully with, as our vaccination increases, that will, that will reduce. And of course, we could uh, uh, get try to do things quicker and get people more metabolically healthier and fitter with the aid of pharmaceutical agents, either weight loss drugs, drugs that lower circulating insulin, or drugs that improve insulin action by putting fat back in adipose tissue. I'm going to stop now for a second and let our illustrators show where they've got to with their, uh, their wonderful diagram. Hi there. Great. Hi, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can. We can oh. hear you. Oh, great. <laughs> Hi there. Yes. Um, wow. What a lot to take in. Uh, I'm just trying to um, find an image uh, that can uh, really tie all of this together. But so far, I've, I've, I've grabbed everything I could the, the, around this topic. Um, I've got a diagram in the middle of uh, COVID entering the lungs and the blood clotting. I'm hoping to get the baseball bat in there as well. And I've got here uh, in the, um, the furthest right hand side of the picture, the, uh, the soggy carpet syndrome taking place where the ectopic fat is sharing a bath with somebody. And um, uh, she's saying, are you sure you're in the right place? Uh, so um, the drawing is uh, developing and please check in with me later to see how I get on. Thanks very much, Josh. I'll just uh, do the screen share again. OK, thanks. So in the last part of my talk, I'm going to move slightly away from COVID-19 and talk about more generally uh, about obesity. Uh, and I mentioned in the last, in my last, in my previous slide, drugs that reduce body weight and drugs that target obesity. And I think for many people, they'll be thinking, well, oh, God, they've got a really bad track record, uh, amphetamines, and then a more recent one that caused depression and had to be stopped. And surely uh, obesity drugs are a bad thing and we shouldn't be encouraging them. People should just lose weight if, if you know, by, by their own voluntary activities, and that isn't that difficult. Well, I'm afraid the first thing to say is, is it is very difficult, and that's why a lot of people uh, are, don't succeed, and, 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 and why I think we do need to think uh, seriously about it. What's happened over the last few decades is a huge increase in the science of how our body weight is controlled. And one thing we've learned is that our guts, our intestinal tract, is rather remarkable. When we ingest food, it doesn't just digest and transmit food. It actually sends a whole load of signals from specialized cells, nerve signals and hormonal signals. And one of those signals is a hormone called GLP-1. People don't like that very well. And GLP-1, among the many things it does, it goes to a bit of our brain. And it's part of that signal that says after a meal, sorry, I'm full now. I can't eat anymore. That's nothing to do, by the way, with fullness. Or, just, or your stomach being stretched. That's mostly to do with these hormone signals that is sent to the brain by the gut as, you, as, as the gut digests and absorbs uh, a food. So the discovery of these hormones have led to the development of treatments based around 
um, making these hormones a bit more stable and being able to give, be given to humans. And in the last few weeks, there's been a, a major trial. And this uh, major trial of sem semaglutide uh, has, been, has been an over a year, a year and three months. People who are obese were given in a double blind uh, uh, manner and didn't know what they were getting the injection once a weekly or a placebo injection. Their doctors didn't know whether they were getting injection or placebo injection. And you can see the sorts of effects you're seeing. This is a percentage body weight change. These are people losing 15% of their body weight, losing stones and stones of weight and keeping it off with a once weekly injection of this uh, natural hormone, if you like, a modified form of the natural hormone. And so I think this is a game changer in the area of obesity. We've finally proven that we can take a substance uh, and give it over a long period of time, get a serious and sustained improvement in body weight. And by the way, all these people improve their fatty liver, improve their pre-diabetic state, all their health markers improved dramatically. And these were people, many of them who had entered previous trials of diet and weight watchers, et cetera. They were determined, they really wanted to lose weight. You can see that even in the placebo, people trying really hard, they lost a couple of a percent of their body weight. And, and, but these lost 15%, the sorts of levels you see after bariatric uh, uh, surgery. So I think this drug uh, does have side effects. It causes a, a, a bit of nausea and, 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 and a little bit of diarrhea in some people, but it's usually if you, if you, if you titrate up the dose slowly, the most people can tolerate it for a period of time. It's injectable and it will be not cheap, and therefore we have to think very seriously about whether we can afford it as a, as a, as a nation. Uh, but I think what it does is it opens the door to say, we need a grown-up conversation about the use of obesity uh, therapeutics uh, uh, as part of the solution to the obesity crisis. And I think it should be part of a joined-up approach. And I, I, I often use this analogy when I'm talking to senior health policy ministers, et cetera, the analogy being what we did with high, high blood pressure. When I was a junior doctor, the wards and the patients I looked after, the wards were full of people with serious emergencies from very high blood pressure, including strokes, renal failure, uh, heart failure. Uh, and, and, and really, we just rarely see that. We do sometimes, and some poor people still struggle. But as a relative proportion, we've effectively cracked the problem of severe high, high blood pressure causing terrible human suffering. And I think we need to learn lessons about how we did that. And if you look back, you know, look at it, hypertension is just a high blood pressure. It's just blood pressure along the distribution that's up here that's causing illness. And obesity is a body fat store that's up here in the top of the end of the distribution and causing problems. So they're very similar in a way. We all have an amount of body fat. We all have a blood pressure. And we'd all like to be further down towards the healthier end of both. How did we do it with high blood pressure? Well, if you had a person in the 1940s with severe blood pressure, they were put on this ghastly rice diet, which very few of them could tolerate, extremely low salt uh, 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 diet. Uh, it worked for a bit, but people found it really difficult to stick to. Stick to. Then in the 1940s, they moved to uh, 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 doing operations, surgical sympathectomy, uh, uh, cutting the, 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 the nerves in the neck, and, and that leading to a, a, a drop in blood pressure, but severe problems with not being able to stand up again. Uh, then there were drugs with severe side effects. Then we went through drugs that were limited effectiveness, but also had bad side effects. But gradually, our science improved. And from the 1970s onwards, we started developing safe and effective blood pressure me me measurements, me me blood, blood pressure uh, uh, therapies that could be used in combination. And as well as this, we had public health advances. We got screening of blood pressure in general practice, and we generally had measures to reduce the salt intake in food. And together, these have had a major uh, impact on hypertension. Where are we in obesity? I think we're 50 years on, but it's a very similar trajectory. We can tell people to diet and exercise, but really most people, or a lot of people, find it exceptionally difficult to do that. We can do bariatric surgery, but that we can't do that on everybody. And it does have some substantial side effects, at least in some, in some people. Then we went through a phrase of having drugs with limited or side effects, either ineffective or significant adverse effects. But we're now starting to get drugs with better efficacy and safety profiles. 
So I would say that we need a multidisciplinary approach to tackle obesity. We tackled blood pressure and hypertension through policies of salt intake, screening, and drugs which are cheap. Now they're cheap, effective, and, in com and used in combination. I think that the amelioration of the adverse health impact of obesity will require that combination of strong public health measures focused on prevention and the selective use of cheap, effective, and safe medications. But for those to be developed properly, we continue to need science. The latter, we will require a deep understanding of how human energy balance is controlled. And just as our vaccine from COVID came from decades of fundamental and high quality research, we need more basic research to understand the physiology of human uh, energy balance. <clears throat> so my take home messages today are obesity is definitely associated with worse outcomes of COVID-19, more so than other respiratory infections. It's more likely to be related to metabolic effects than any mechanical effects of too much fat tissue. This is good news because even a small amount of weight loss can improve metabolism before it impacts on the fat mass of fat. So a message to you is lose a pound, walk a mile, it's better than nothing, and it could improve your chance if you, if you encounter uh, the virus. Instead of trialing drugs just at the virus or inflammation, we should also be thinking about trialing drugs that rapidly improve the metabolic state of obese and insulin-resistant people. My final <clears throat> tip is, if you're going to take up uh, running that mile, don't take your fashion tips from the Prime Minister. So, thank you. Okay, um, Steve. We've got uh, quite a few questions in the Q&A. Can you see them? Yeah, I do. I'll, I'll start from the top and, and work my way down, if I may. Um, Rosemary Aitchison has asked, is there a certain level of BMI which we should reach no matter what sort of body build we have, or does it vary according to body build? That's a great question. BMI is great in the population. It's really helpful when you're, when you're studying thousands and thousands of people. It's not so precise when you're dealing with one individual. Of course, you know, a very muscular heptathlete sort of person will have an artificially increased BMI because they've got so much muscle. So it is tricky at the extremes, but in general, for most of us, it's not a bad sort of thumbnail of uh, uh, it's it's a very it's a reasonable guide it, it doesn't work for everybody it's not perfect uh, measures of percentage body fat are probably better uh, and you can get those you know the, 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 these days with, with various meters that you can buy if you're really keen uh, but but um, it, it's not bad for most people uh, uh, so I would say that somebody's asked where we can they can access the recording uh, after uh, uh, this, I'm afraid, Jane, I'll have to ask you to maybe at the end of that to, to answer to answer that. Um, so the the Nick Alcock has asked, um, a, a bit surprised not to see more of a direct role. I think what, what what Nick's question is getting to is does disruption of that ACE2 itself is that key to a lot of the vascular and problems? That's a great question. Uh, and I think a lot of scientists, a lot of endocrinologists have thought initially that it might. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for believing that it might not be that, 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 that directly involved. It, 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 the main ACE that we think about when you give it ACE inhibitor is a different, it's a different angiotensin tensin converting enzyme it, and, and, and the virus doesn't attack that. Also ACE2 function in the body as a whole is not that disruptive because the virus, is, you know, unlike uh, viruses like Ebola, for example, which goes all over your body. Th th there's not that much evidence that, that, that we see much of the SARS-CoV-2 in many, uh, many other parts of, uh, par parts of the body. Uh, and Nick also mentions about other vascular diseases and obesity are not friends. That's true. Obesity increases atherosclerotic arterial disease. But what we're seeing in the lungs of people who die of COVID is not that. We're seeing really thrombi within the microvasculature of the lung, a very different type of vascular event. But I'm, I'm, but I'm sure that uh, uh, you know, we will eventually find that, inhibit, that, that something is going, that ACE2 not working in the lung may be contributing locally within the lung to a process that we're not really uh, understanding fully yet. So, that, so, so, so thank you. Um, uh, let me, sorry, oh, I'm thinking things are moving around a bit. Why are obese children? The, you know, the fascinating question is why children generally are doing so well with, uh, with, with, with COVID because there are, you know, there are certain conditions that children don't do 
uh, particularly well with flu. Influenza, for example, kills uh, young children. Uh, and it's, it's, so it's not as if children don't get really bad pneumonias. So it's really a mystery. And this age effect uh, with, with, co with SARS-CoV-2 is extraordinary. And it's extraordinary across the full range. And, and yes, you're right. Uh, what, what, what we do see, though, is that uh, the very few small, uh, you know, if you get down and you find somebody who's on ITU who's in their teens or late 20s, they're pretty often very obese. So obesity does, in relative terms, seem to increase that risk uh, 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 reasonably substantially. Uh, Lisa C asks, uh, why can't the body just make more precursor cells for the great, oh, I wish, that's a fantastic question. Uh, and, and yes, I think there are people who have more sub subcutaneous fat on their bodies. It, it's very likely that there are some people born with a huge capacity to put on uh, uh, fat, fat cells. So, you know, quite often when we, if, if you ever read a, uh, one of the tabloid newspapers and it gives it, told you an article about somebody who's, who the ambulance had to, or the fire brigade had to come in because they were so large, they had to take them from the house. Those people often don't have the adverse effects of obesity. They're massively obese, but they don't have diabetes, for example. And, and, and that's probably because they have this vast bath, if you like, they're, they're, they have a, a tremendous capacity to keep putting down adipose tissue and putting the fat in adipose tissue. Uh, and if we understood, we, we'd love to understand more about what what causes it. We are beginning from human genetic studies to understand the genetic predispositions to not being able to make enough subcutaneous uh, uh, fat, fat precursors. Uh, <clears throat> so that's a, it's a great question and one where we're really actively involved in, 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 in uh, uh, Maria H just said something very nice to me. Thank you, Maria, for enjoying, my, enjoying the talk. Um, so Sarah Hall, uh, oh, no, sorry, Anya has asked, if an obese person changes their diet, and well, not so much changes their diet, but just eats less calories and exercises and becomes a healthier weight, ectopic levels, fat levels would fall. C3 levels, yes, they would fall. Adiponectin levels would go back up. Systematic inflammation, yes, all of that. Uh, and the nice thing is many of these things, particularly the ectopic fat, can start to disappear well before you see much change in the actual weight or, or waist measurement itself. You can really see if you put somebody on a very uh, a, a tight diet you, and, and measure their liver fat using magnetic resonance imaging, you can see the, the, the fat disappearing out of the liver quicker than it disappears out of, out of uh, other places. So that's uh, um, uh, you know, really important to, to, to know. Um, v. Anderson asked, uh, is there a right place to store fat and a wrong place to store fat? Well, what we know about is correlation rather than causation. But what I would say is that uh, if you take people who are equally, have an equal amount of stored fat and you have people who store it on their buttocks and thighs versus who store it inside their tummies, the ones who store it on the buttock and thighs tend to have far less uh, metabolic problems than those who store it in, in, in the tummy. Now, what research that we've been doing with our colleagues in, in, in the MRC epidemiology unit suggests is something a little bit a little bit counterintuitive. You, you might think that it's the, the excess fat in the tummy that's the problem. But what we've actually been showing is it's the lack of ability to store it in these thighs and, and buttocks that is the problem with the spilling into the visceral fat being, being really a manifestation of a, of a lack of ability to make fat uh, uh, in, 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 on hips and thighs. So uh, there is these differences. It is safer to have uh, sub subcutaneous rather than visceral uh, uh, <clears throat> fat. Um, uh, Craig, uh, sorry, Sarah called semaglutide. Uh, when you say keeping it off, what time scale are you talking about? And would it be just when the drug uh, is on board? Um, so the time scale so far with the longest trial is, is around 15 months and, and the, and the people have, were, stay, were still losing a little bit of weight even after between 12 and 15 months, but it was stable for the last three months of that. Um, like all drugs, I mean, I use the, the blood pressure analogy. Um, we, we, we give people blood pressure drugs to reduce their blood pressure. If they stop them, their blood pressure will go back up. Uh, and so there's no magic about anti-obesity drugs. You, we will need to think about them as long-term uh, assistance for people who have uh, who, are, who need them, and, and particularly those who become metabolically sick when they are obese. So um, the, 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 
the, the weight loss is sustainable, but as long as you stay on the drug, and that's exactly the same as it is for high blood pressure, which we obviously treat in, in millions of people in the UK every, every year and, 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 and have great health benefits from doing so. So I think if we can find a safe and affordable anti-obesity agent, we may have to have the same attitude as we have to taking anti-blood pressure agents long-term, i.e. we just want to keep people well, uh, and that's our principal, our principal aim, but they may need to, can need to continue to have the assistance of pharmacological uh, 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 um, assistance. Um, where are we? Um, sorry, I'm, I, there's a lot of things zipping in and out. It's hard for me to follow. Uh, Craig Langton has asked, is there a difference in response between obese men and women with re regards to COVID-19? I think the, the, the evidence is that uh, women generally do better than men, but the, 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 the relationship between body mass index and worsening is similar between in the two, in the two uh, uh, genders, the, the two sexes. So uh, uh, um, then um, there's Claire has asked if the severe outcomes of COVID are caused by the immune system overreacting. Why do older people with typically worse, worse immune systems seem to do worse? That's a fantastic question. And one in which I, I have tried to put to my more sophisticated immunology uh, colleagues. Um, I, 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 I'm not gonna come up with a, a facile answer uh, for that. Um, so, there's a difference between, uh, just to say, really, there's a difference between an, 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 an inflamed system and an effective immune system. And so I think a lot of this could be down to signal and noise. Uh, and, uh, in other words, not, 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 not all uh, responses, uh, inflammatory responses are good inflammatory responses. And, and, we, and we may get uh, you know, le less good at, at, at making the right ones as we get older, but I, 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 I don't claim any deep knowledge of that. And the, effect of aging, I know, has mystified even my most sophisticated immunological colleagues. So that's a great question, and I wish I could give you a clearer answer to that, but I can't. Um, do, do ob Lisa Tamari, do, do obese uh, individuals also fare worse in terms of recovery? I guess you're asking now about whether they've survived to come off and whether there's uh, worse long COVID. I don't think we know the answer to that yet. Um, uh, I, I think there's not been enough data now on obesity versus the long COVID recovery time, but that's a great question and one which I'm, so, I'm sure will be addressed and, and, and answered. Brian Na has asked, the UK is, is number one for obesity in Western Europe. Why are our leaders not more, doing more uh, to address this? That's a very big question, a political one as well as a scientific, well, it's really, really effectively only a political question. Uh, it, it does seem that we had, uh, you know, a, a resistance in this country to uh, some of the what previously been thought of as nanny state interventions. It didn't seem to be consonant with the British way of handling things. But I think uh, the current government is taking a, a somewhat more uh, uh, interventionist approach uh, in, in, in that with, 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 with an obesity strategy that at least might have some teeth. Um, but uh, um, so I, I think, you know, watch the space. There may, be, there may be some improvements there. I think as well as needing to do the necessary public health piece, we also, uh, you know, we do far less treatment of obesity. We, we don't take obesity seriously enough as something that needs, you know, seriously ill people with obesity need help. Uh, I mean, in a country like Sweden, for example, they do more bariatric surgery operations in Sweden than we do in Britain, a much larger country with a much bigger obese Problem. So we and even do more in France, where there where there's some significantly lower amounts of obesity than Britain. So I think we need to, as I say, have a have the grown up conversation with our, our, our those who govern us, both in terms of the public health strategies, but also taking obesity seriously as a disabling and difficult medical condition. Uh, and um, um, yes, and 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 take do look at it from all angles. Now Jane has asked me to stop for a moment, and we can look at how the illustration is coming on. Hello, yes, hi there. Um, wow, again, there's so much to take in. I'm not sure if I've even got space, uh, but I've done my best to, to capture some of the uh, uh, wrap up comments in the, on the right hand side of the drawing, where we talked about brain chemistry, perhaps holding the key to uh, regulate, regulating appetite and, uh, and that kind of thing. Um, uh, I'm, I've drawn a heart next to the brain and I'm going to 
do a piece about learning from uh, studies we've done with uh, high blood pressure, what we can learn from there. And in the, in the, um, in the bottom right hand corner, I've written, uh, we need a multidisciplinary approach to increasing metabolic state. And if I've got space, I will definitely be drawing Boris <laughs> and his, uh, in his fashion uh, blog, uh, as you described. Thanks very much, Josh. I think we've probably got time for Steve to answer one more question. Uh, one more question. OK. Um, somebody, let me see. Um, Anne, Anna Smoliar has asked if we're doing any more trials for obese people and tell us a bit more about the ones we've done. Now, when you say we, I, I, my own research has, has, has been particularly focused on, on, on severe obesity in children with, with genetic forms of obesity. And we have done some treatments in those, but they're very targeted to the rare causes in those children. Uh, my colleagues in the Addenbrooke's Hospital Obesity Clinic have participated in some of the other uh, larger trials and will, I hope, be doing more. So we do have uh, an obesity service at, at Addenbrooke's Hospital uh, uh, and, and um, my colleagues there, uh, although primarily clinicians, do get involved in, 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 in pharmaceutical uh, uh, trials uh, of, of obesity uh, uh, agents. Uh, so um, the, the, I, I think you'll see in the next few years, there'll be probably more opportunities to become involved in, 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 in those, in those uh, 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 trials. So I think uh, I'm being told, I'm sorry, there's lots and lots of questions and it's great to have said so many, so many uh, uh, questions, but I mean, asked to wrap up. Uh, and so sorry to those of you, I haven't been able to answer your, your questions. Uh, delighted that it obviously brought so much interest. Thanks very much, Steve, for an interesting talk. And thanks everybody for coming tonight. Great, cheerio.